Hello, everyone. I'm Matt Kaplan from the Planetary Society, the host of Planetary Radio. Very happy to be once again part of this Humans to Mars Summit. It is one of my favorite events every year and uh, have some extra duties this time around. We're going to be introducing you to representatives of some of the fantastic sponsors that every year have made H2M possible, and that is no less true this time around. We're going to meet in a few moments John Mulholland of Boeing, which uh, the company needs no further introduction. John is the vice president uh, in charge of all international space station operations uh, at Boeing and has had a long career there and has done a lot of other stuff. We're going to go into a video that uh, John has pre-recorded, a special presentation for us. Stay with us, though. After that, we'll come back and talk to John live, uh, a little bit about what he's talked about and maybe a couple of other things. So uh, thanks, very, thanks very much again for joining us, and we'll roll that video now. Good morning, and thanks for inviting me to speak at this year's Human to Mars Summit. This is an exciting time in the space industry. We have new spacecraft and rockets emerging from development, and we are putting the International Space Station to more uses as our imaginations catch up with its extraordinary capabilities. To see so much enthusiasm from across the globe makes me confident we'll achieve our goals of reaching Mars and exploring our nearest planetary neighbor in a sustainable way. This year's conference comes during the year we are marking one of the great milestones in space exploration. 20 years of continuous habitation aboard the International Space Station. Think about that for a moment. Men and women have been working off planet for 20 straight years. ISS is the realization of a dream that has inspired countless generations to reach for the stars. Now we're taking it to the next level, deep space human habitation. So let's look at how we got here. There's a lot wrapped up in that accomplishment. Along with the challenge of building a spacecraft as big as a football field with the living area of a five to six bedroom house, we built a spacecraft that operates as a laboratory, produces its own electricity, and is modular so it can be upgraded with new technology and even more capabilities. At Boeing, our role as NASA's prime contractor for the space station is to operate, maintain, and sustain the ISS hand in glove with NASA. We also integrate systems and experiments and produce upgrades such as a new set of lithium ion batteries that were just installed a couple months ago. We have programs both in operation and development in human spaceflight that are aimed at opening space to more uses and more people. The International Space Station is the cornerstone of operational spaceflight. We have the Starliner program, partnered with NASA's Commercial Crew program, that will provide transportation to the International Space Station, as well as other low Earth orbit destinations. To accomplish that same feat in deep space, we need a heavy lift rocket that can carry crew and cargo faster and farther than ever before possible. That's NASA's Space Launch System, set to launch next year. The core stage of the SLS is delivered and is at the B-2 test stand in Mississippi, getting ready for its final test. That green run test will demonstrate that the SLS, a Saturn V class rocket, can handle the demands of launching astronauts beyond Earth orbit, one day even to Mars. At the same time, we're building NASA's next two Artemis rockets and finalizing the exploration upper stage design. SLS is the only rocket that can lift the 27-ton Orion spacecraft with its fuel out of Earth's atmosphere in a single launch. In fact, when combined with the exploration upper stage, SLS can take the Orion into space along with other modules if needed. It can throw 45 tons to the moon and 35 tons to Mars. It's 234 days of travel to Mars, so getting there fast while carrying life-sustaining cargo with you is critical to building a sustainable human presence in the Mars orbit. Just as we've done in low Earth orbit, the rocket has to be human rated and it has to be able to lift huge mass and volume past low Earth orbit. No other rocket can do that. We need the EUS enabled SLS to do humans to Mars. To be sure, the International Space Station has widened access to space, first as a daunting engineering achievement across 15 nations, then as a burgeoning home for astronauts. We are undaunted by the challenge of doing the same thing in deep space. The ISS now operates as a full-fledged world-class laboratory and has generated important science with the capacity to produce much more in the coming years. The most important aspect of this laboratory is the ability to conduct research and manufacturing without the influence of gravity. 
A lot of the conversations about Mars tend to focus on rocket engines and propulsion systems. Those things are vital, but so are the elements that make a spacecraft safe and habitable for humans. Life support, control systems, repair plans, and the all-important operations and support teams on Earth who work closely with the crew around the clock. Because it operates in the vacuum of space and without the influence of gravity, the ISS is ideal for testing the systems needed for exploration, the devices that will allow astronauts to have air to breathe, water to drink, and the spacesuits they will need to venture out on the Martian surface. We know from experience on ISS that a life support system can work well for months on end and then suddenly fail. Aboard ISS, there are other systems to take on that load so the crew can make the repairs and get them back to testing the deep space systems. Add that to the communication systems that can effectively communicate with Earth. Ways to have the right tools at the right time for the repairs without adding too much weight and even systems to safely discard trash. All of these things are easy on Earth, but no one has tried to tackle the fundamental challenges that are part of a two-year mission to Mars. ISS is the ideal testbed for exploration systems. It is able to conduct real-world tests on new systems without putting the mission, people, or other spacecraft in jeopardy. Life support systems, water, and air recycling have been landmark technology developments. We have also seen adaptations to make existing hardware run faster and more effectively. For example, we recently doubled the router speed aboard the ISS, giving the spacecraft the ability to communicate more information to the ground teams and to improve the quality of life for the station crew. Naturally, the experiences aboard the ISS drive a lot of what we learn. But I will also point out that we have learned a lot in the past 20 years about how to operate a crewed spacecraft consistently, how to keep the crew properly supplied, what needs to be done by the crew, and what can be done from the ground, such as operating the robotic arm, and how to provide safe ways to tackle problems that come up. Also, the ISS is training astronauts on the demands of long duration flight. It took only a couple of years of the ISS to surpass all the time American astronauts had spent in space up to the point of the ISS construction and the first crew members came aboard. Also, astronauts who go to the station now go with broad and general training that can be adapted to specific tasks as they are needed. That was a major departure from the space shuttle experience in which astronauts spent their time training on specific tasks for that mission. That worked for two-week missions, but months-long flights demanded broader knowledge, and we adjusted to it. When you're looking for something to compare the ISS with, don't limit yourself to other spacecraft, because there aren't any that have done what the ISS has. Instead, look at other national labs here on Earth, the names you know, such as Los Alamos and Lawrence Livermore. The ISS is in the same category. Every national lab has a specialty, something no other place can do or do nearly as well. For ISS, that specialty is microgravity experiments. I think that factor shows why the ISS will remain part of the human spaceflight infrastructure while the astronauts head to Mars. Boeing has its own Starliner spacecraft that is being developed to take astronauts, professional and non-professional, to the ISS as part of NASA's commercial crew program. For many years, the impediment to fully using the extraordinary capabilities of the ISS has been the task of crossing that 250 miles from the Earth's surface to the space station. No easy task, but one that we are working to make less daunting. Starliner launches on an Atlas V rocket, the most reliable launch vehicle in its class. It can hold up to seven people and is designed to reach the ISS six hours after launch. As importantly, it can reach other low Earth orbit destinations as they materialize. I've talked about the flexibility of the ISS and Starliner, and I'm very glad to say that that feature is prominent for Boeing's contribution to deep space exploration, the Space Launch System rocket. We are building the core stage of the SLS, which is the huge center of the launch vehicle with the orange insulation. It resembles the external tank used on the space shuttle at liftoff, but is about twice as long. With four engines at the base and two solid fuel boosters, plus a four engine upper stage, the SLS is strong enough to lift the Orion spacecraft and a crew and place them safely in orbit around the moon. More powerful versions in the near future will have the strength to add other spacecraft segments too. 
to assemble a small gateway near the moon that can also serve as a way station for astronauts headed to Mars. When you look at all the plans for Orion, landers, and gateway, it's great to know that a rocket as powerful as the SLS is on the verge of launching and will be able to hoist all of them, not only to orbit, but all the way to the moon and then to Mars. None of this endeavor is easy, but the steady development of new technology and diversifying skills, pushed by the determination and imagination, is making the chances of success much greater. Again, thanks for the opportunity to speak to you today. John Mulholland, Vice President of Boeing, lead VP in charge of everything ISS, the International Space Station. And as you can see on your screen, John has now joined us. Welcome, John, and thank you for this support of uh, H2M 2020. Hey, thank you. It's a real pleasure to, to speak with you today. I got to say, there was one really striking thing that you may you said in that statement right up front that caught me. Uh, and it was something like, uh, as our imaginations catch up with its extraordinary capabilities, it, of course, being the ISS, that really has been kind of the 20 plus year of this space station, hasn't it? We keep discovering new things that can be done there. It's amazing. And I'll tell you, coming in uh, new to the International Space Station program, I had spent five years away uh, working on a different program. And it was really staggering to me coming back in, seeing the significant increase in science that's being conducted on a daily basis. Uh, it was, it, it just, it made you feel really good uh, that we're really capitalizing on the investment of this incredibly um, or this incredible national laboratory. I've had the honor of getting to talk to some of the people who are conducting some of that science and they are thrilled to have this microgravity environment to be doing this work in. And I forgot to congratulate you on this move from running the CST-100 Starliner program to running ISS. Uh, and before we go on with a little bit of ISS, I, I guess we should say something about Starliner, which apparently just last Friday, we heard from Boeing and NASA appears to be on track. There's going to be another uncrewed test later this year, and a lot of work has been done between that last test and now. Yeah, incredible amount of work and, and uh, significant progress. That team will be ready uh, by the end of this year to uh, conduct a second uh, orbital flight test. So we can't wait to uh, to have them uh, dock to the ISS and, and then get on to crewed missions because, as you know, the amount of science that we conduct on the ISS is based on um, the number of astronauts that were up there uh, able to do that work. So we're eagerly anticipating um, not only Crew-1 to, uh, to come to the ISS this year, but to, uh, to get the CST Starliner uh, flying humans to the space station again soon. It's a lot to look forward to. Your uh, colleagues at Boeing gave me a preview, I think I got to see more of it, of that beautiful animation of uh, really humans on their way to Mars, departing what appeared to be the gateway and heading out for the red planet. It's a, it's a tall order, which uh, Boeing is certainly going to be deeply involved in. I mean, wh what would you like to see happen with getting humans to Mars and, and really this future that we're looking forward to, with we're, if we're very lucky, still happening maybe in the mid to late 19, uh, 2030s? Oh, absolutely. And I think uh, the, the NASA plan to to do both the um, the next lunar uh, exploration and then onto Mars in a sustainable way. I think setting that foundation is going to be incredibly important. As we've seen with the International Space Station, um, and and kind of highlighted in the introductory remarks that we talked about, we don't know all of the science uh, and all the activities that uh, that are going to be available for us uh, back on the lunar surface and then at Mars. And so creating a sustainable infrastructure there, I think, is is really setting the foundation uh, to allow even more exploration, more science discoveries than we can even imagine today. Just on the engineering side, if you could say something about the ISS's value in preparing us for deep space missions. I mean, I have had, I recently had a guest on the show uh, talking about the enormous advances just in life support, recovery of water, which are to me, nothing short of miraculous, but really that's just one example. Yeah, and I think uh, two two fundamental um, 
significant contributions that the ISS has made will continue to make as we as we continue this journey. And the first one you did mention, uh, the exploration hardware. Uh, this is the laboratory that's gonna allow us to, to take it up there and, and validate its use in deep space. The big difference, uh, you know, as you know, with, with the ISS, you're hours away from being able to bring hardware back home, bring people back home. Uh, when we go out to Mars, it, it's a year long uh, endeavor. And, and so we not only have to have equipment that uh, we're sure is gonna work, uh, we're gonna need to be able to repair it and, and have the capability to do in situ repair uh, on that journey. Uh, and the processes and, and the procedures that the astronauts are going to need to uh, to fix hardware that will inevitably have some problems. Uh, the second thing that I think the ISS uh, contribution it's going to be significant uh, is is long duration human uh, exposure to microgravity and 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 we've seen that on ISS. We've been flying crews for for up to a year. Uh, we're going to need to continue uh, that research and, and understand the effects that it has on, on the human beings uh, in that kind of an environment. So both of those contributions, I think, are central to a successful uh, Mars mission. I will give a little plug to uh, anybody who has seen this uh, video before Thursday, this coming Thursday at the Humans to Mars Summit, uh, because I'll actually be moderating a session uh, that we'll be talking about how the ISS is preparing us for these kinds of deep space missions, really long durations and making sure that humans stay healthy and happy and are ready to explore Mars. We all know that getting to Mars, getting humans there, is not going to be cheap. It's uh, going to be a multi-year effort. I wonder, if you don't mind the question, can we afford to explore deep space and keep operating the ISS? And I'm gonna guess that maybe the answer is, can we afford not to? I think that's that's exactly the right answer. It's uh, really the uh, the operational cost of the International Space Station is is really a small fraction of, of that investment. And and the payback that we're getting on that investment is, is, is huge. Uh, not only now with science and discovery and uh, creating or validating new medicines um, to help us here on earth, but the investment that uh, that we're making right now uh, to enable that exploration and and do it in in a safer and more efficient manner uh, is is really uh, foundational, I think, uh, to the future and the exploration of Mars. John, I guess that's about all the time we have for this very short segment. I just want to thank you for joining us, and also uh, thank you and all of Boeing for uh, once again being a major sponsor of uh, the Humans to Mars Summit this year. Uh, thanks again. Hey, thank you very much. It's outstanding. John Mulholland, Vice President, Lead of All ISS Operations, International Space Station Operations for Boeing. Once again, a major sponsor of this year's Humans to Mars Summit.